The following is an interview with my friend, Mike Hamill. Mike is a writer, former pastor, and multiple cancer survivor. We're so glad he could come on Doc to Doc to share his story with our listeners. Throughout the interview, we learn how Mike was an active participant with his medical team. This is so important when facing a major medical illness. He wrote a book about it called Stumbling Toward Heaven. It's available on Amazon.com. We'll put a link in the show notes. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us at rob at doctordoc.health or abbas at doctordoc.health, and we'll be sure to get back to you. We're planning to do an upcoming episode where we feature your questions and comments. And without further ado, here's our interview with Mike Hamill. Welcome to Doc to Doc Podcast. My name is Abbas Shafi, gastroenterologist. And I'm Rob Hoyer, medical oncologist. This is a podcast about lifestyle medicine, disease prevention, and longevity. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Please consult your physician for individualized therapies. Please also check out our website at doc2doc.health. That's D-O-C, number two, D-O-C, dot health. There you can leave us messages, make suggestions for future episodes, and ask us questions. And now, on to the show. Like I said in the intro, we're here with Mike Hamill, who is a, uh, an author, a former pastor, and a multi, multiple cancer survivor. And Mike, welcome. We're so glad you could join us. And could you tell us a little bit about yourself and maybe your life uh, before your, your, these major diagnoses and, and after? Well, thanks for having me. I uh, just turned 70, and until I was 55, I had excellent health. I'd never been in a hospital except to visit friends and family. I was happily married, uh, had four kids, 10 grandkids, so uh, life was going along well until I noticed a lump in my lower abdomen, and I went to the doctor, and on the way there, I almost turned around and went home because I didn't have any pain, and I thought, I'm being a hypochondriac, and so maybe I should just ignore this. But I went ahead and went, and uh, it turned out I had a a tumor the size of a grapefruit. (laughs) which I hadn't noticed until it got big enough to protrude on other organs, because my understanding now is the lymph lymph nodes don't have any pain nerves. So there's no way to tell something is wrong until it's big enough to affect other symptoms. So I went to a specialist, and his initial diagnosis off the cuff was an omental mass, which, uh, being a former Catholic, I thought that was something I had missed in parochial school, but <laughs> That's great. it turns out to be legit. And of course, the first thing you do when you get a diagnosis is you go home and Google it, and you find out an mental mass is 98%, you know, fatal and all these other horrendous things. So, <laughs> so I went back, and this is something maybe we'll touch on in a little bit. My initial uh, GP, who got the original, who made the original off-the-cuff diagnosis, sent me to a specialist, and I felt like. The, my initial response with my GP was not, uh, I felt like um, a cog in a machine. I went in, I got my five minutes, he moved on to the next place. I didn't feel like I got the interaction that I needed for that kind of diagnosis, uh, which is one reason I went ahead and changed doctors because I felt like on this journey where my life was at stake, I wanted somebody who was engaged with me and not just you know moving the patients through the assembly line. So at 55, I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and uh, I went to a specialist. And again, the specialist I found for the second time uh, with my encounter for doctors at this level was a a kind of a a callousness and uh, we'll get you scheduled, move it along, please. What was very life-threatening to me was just, you know, a day at the office for them. So I made a third change and I went to Memorial uh, cancer clinic and had a chance to talk to the, du- the then director, Dr. Dax Kerbikoff. And after initial contact and consultation, he got in. He got me in to see him the next week. And I felt like with that contact, he saw me as a person. And even though I'm probably one of hundreds of patients that he had dealt with, I felt like he engaged with me personally, gave me the information, got me the services that I needed as quickly as I needed them. And I've been, uh, I've been at Memorial Health ever since. It's good to know. I think the human to human contact sometimes is one of the biggest things on remedy and relieving some of the stressors from the things. And sometimes in health profession, this is with today's with this sort of 
the medicine going toward the you know, business model is getting lost day by day. So it's very important to, to know that the human touch is still is, I think, is an, I think medicine is an art, and I think having that art of communication, you know, hopefully people, they can keep it and they understand that's very important yeah. for the patient. I think there has to be the balance because this is a multi-million dollar uh, endeavor, and it takes money to do cancer research and to run the clinical trials and to do those things. So it, you have to watch the, the financial bottom line, but there's also the human Factor. bottom line that these are real people going through this process. So that's that's a balance. It's um, it's an expensive undertaking. Um, probably the, I figure at one point after my second bone marrow transplant that Medicare had spent as much on me as it cost to buy one cruise missile. So <laughs> it's, it's not a cheap, yeah. if you want to save money, don't get cancer because mm-hmm. it's, it's expensive. <laughs> True. So, Mike, you mentioned the, that relationship, and so clearly you selected your doctors very carefully, and you it sounds like interviewed them to, to make sure that they were on the same page with you. Could you give any other yes. tips that you that you use when you work with the doctors, and how do you because it's you had great clearly had great care and treatment, but I think there's something else here, like uh, other other parts of this, whether it was your reading or your how you manage information or ask questions. Could you go through that a little bit? Yeah, everybody's a little different. So uh, I am a curious person, and I've uh, been a writer for 25 years. So uh, when I got cancer, I decided that this was all new territory for me. So I was going to journal as I went through this procedure this process so that I could share it with others because I found as I started to read that I gained a lot of helpful information and encouragement from people who had cancer or treated people with cancer and took the time to write about it. So books were a very important uh, teacher for me. The the internet is a two-edged sword because you can find good information there and you can find bad information and too much of of the latter. So you have to be careful not to think because I have Google and Wikipedia, I can know more than my doctor. Correct. What I think online can do is help you find the right kinds of questions to ask of your medical professionals. And then I found the way they treat you when you ask the questions about your own diagnosis is a key to how engaged they are. That is correct. I think it's very, very important that when the patient is involved with his own care, it's making from our point of view, the management is much better. And also, also give a sort of this team approach to resolving the, the, the issues. As you said, today's some people, they, as soon as they get a diagnosis and a piece of paper, they Google and get terrified <laughs> of what's consequences of their future. But it's good to tailor it to that patient. It's not the spectrum of the disease that in, in each person is individually yeah. involved. Well, I found doing research, I, uh, the word patient is somewhat um, unfortunate because it implies a passivity. Mm-hmm. That I'm a patient, I go to the mm-hmm. professional and right. I do whatever they say. Right. And I, I added the perspective of being a client looking for a service, and that service was necessary to maintain my life. So y- you can you can compare shop, which is harder to do in our medical system because you don't get the cost and pricing. But you can say that I'm I'm in charge of my life. A doctor mm-hmm. is a is an assistant to help me, and I want the best I can get. But um, so you, your research helps you know how to find the best professionals to be on your team, not to replace them. That's terrific. That's 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 great novel idea, and I think it's helpful for many patients to be that way, but as simply as reflux or as uh, complex as cancer. I think that's terrific. And information changes so much. I mean, bone marrow transplants, of which I've had two, haven't been around that long. And the procedures change constantly. New drugs are coming out, CAR T cells, all kinds of studies and things. So you you want to try to be informed to be a, a, a good patient, but you also want to be um, to listen to the people who are trained to do this and have the skill set and the expertise. Did, did your approach change at all when you had the, the recurrence of the lymphoma or the, the, the head and neck cancer when you had that? Did, when you had those, those recurrences or new cancer come up, did your approach change at all? Did, did it, did it I, I felt like I was, metal, I was mentally prepared for the options going into, uh, the, the first response to my uh, lymphoma was a round of chemo mm-hmm. and, and the cancer went into remission post chemo and then it came back so the how next, long were you in remission uh less than a year oh i see okay i did the six rounds of chemo okay. and then about a year later the uh 
with the, with the follow-up of the medical team, the cancer returned, and so I was scheduled for a bone marrow transplant. And again, I was given the odds of here, here are your options. You can do this, that, or the other. Here are the odds. Um, so after the bone marrow transplant, the lymphoma was gone for seven years. And at, after five years, you're released back into the general population. Um, so I wasn't tracked anymore for the lymphoma. But as a result of the cancer treatments, I developed uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And as most people realize, the treatment for cancer is carcinogenic <laughs> because it's chemicals and it's radiation, it's those things. So uh, I had a, what they call a secondary cancer, uh, which required uh, chemo and radiation sure. and surgery. So I felt fortunate in that my remission lasted as long as it did. And then when, the, when every time cancer returns, you have to have a new strategy because that means the cancer's figured its way around the previous efforts. So you have to, you have to raise the ante. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where the medical professions uh, are key because as your case becomes more complex, there are more moving parts to manage. So you want somebody that can help you understand your options, uh, give their best advice, uh, and help you make your own decisions. That's the balance, I think. And also having previous cancer, the accumulation of the radiation and previous chemo on the other organs becomes more and more important as well. Yep. Agree. Yeah. When you were blogging and doing all this, was there? A, did you know that you were going to write a book, or did, did you just kind of did it kind of come to? How, how did that come together when you were? And, and by the way, the first book, "Stumbling Toward Heaven," which we'll put in the show notes, and there's a second book we will be landing shortly, and perhaps a third book coming here. But I'm curious about this first book. How did it come to fruition? And you, you enjoy, clearly you're a great writer, and you enjoy writing, but. I'm curious how that process started. Um, I decided to blog at first because I wanted to keep track of what was going on in real time. So I would take, uh, I would record on my phone, I would take video, I would write at when I was having chemo, when I was in the hospital with procedures, because I knew in the future I wouldn't be able to remember the emotions and the feelings. So I figured I would blog, which I did several times a week, and then post um, transplant, I had the time to pull those individual blogs into a book and make more narrative sense out of it. Uh, but I would, uh, I remember going up to the bone marrow clinic in Denver and having to sign a HIPAA relief to take my own picture in the chemo clinic. <laughs> so they're pretty, they're pretty uh, <laughs> sensitive about privacy. So. But I interviewed my doctor, did some videos on, on YouTube and uh, tried to, it's like going to a different country. So I tried to say, here are the travel notes. Mm -hmm. And I tried to document what it might feel like for somebody going through it for the first time. You know, what's a bone marrow biopsy? And what do you do when somebody comes at you with a needle the size of a number two pencil? Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these other things. It kind of takes the, uh, it takes some of the surprise out of it. And I did it because some of the most helpful books that I read were written by cancer patients. Mm -hmm and they were describing the procedure. So that was helpful and I figured, you know, as long as I'm going through this, I might as well, you know, leave some notes for people who might find themselves on a similar journey. Yeah, for many physicians doing a procedure, I'm doing, you know, scopes all the time, but for us after a while, this becomes routine and I keep telling my colleagues, this is for every individual, <laughs> this is a new thing. This is the new thing for them. So we have to not just rumble through the things because it's just, Everybody knows, but for many people, this is like a, a bone marrow, which I've done in the past. It's just a, a, a scary thought to to do, and, and many people they feel like this is, a, you know, when they take the bone marrow out, they feel like some part of the spirit or something coming out. So, so it's it's, it's good, and I, I love the way you wrote about it. How do you keep your spirit through all of this? That's 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 you know, just the, your spirituality, both being religion, just just keeping staying positive. How'd that go on? That's, you know, the mental is as important as the physical, and there have been enough research and studies to, to say that. So to the extent that you can maintain a positive attitude, not a Pollyanna-ish where you just close your eyes and hope everything works out, but look at, the, look at the stats and then do what you can to put your finger on one side of the scale rather than the other. Um, I think it's very helpful if you have a supportive network, family, friends, coworkers, people you can talk to. I've seen in movies and heard about people who when they get a serious diagnosis, they don't want to tell anybody because they think it might burden them. But then that leaves you to carry 
you know, the burden alone. And part of what family and friends do is carry burdens. So you do need to be upright, I think, with spouses, with children, with people who are important to you so that they can help carry that burden. And I found my support network to be very helpful. They're there to drive you for chemo lessons. They're there are lessons. <laughs> We have those two <laughs> Keep education, education sessions. Education, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think a supportive network. If you've got one, lean into it as much as you can. If you don't have one, see about developing one. I know there were cancer, there are support groups, there are all kinds of options offered through Memorial Health. So plug into those things and then try to accentuate the positive. I uh, have talked to my patient that when they do not only to let them meet their loved one to know because they, sometimes they're suffering by themselves and keep it hidden and people do not know. Mm-hmm. I second to the co-worker. So if they go sort of weak to, to the work, they understand they're going through, you know, a bad session of what diagnosis, whether not only I'm sure physically, there is financially is a burden. I have seen many of my patients, you know, for just diagnosis of colon cancer, suddenly they lost their job and then the insurance and that's become a thing. So, so when people, they know about you, they, they're more, I think we're all human, no matter how at work we are, how yeah. we want to be productive. I think that's, that's up to I them. was working a job at, the time, at a time with the company up in, in Denver, and I had, to, uh, I had to leave that. I went on unemployment. It eventually led to having to uh, negotiate with a couple credit card companies. And when you say, look, I've got cancer, I can't work here, it's my situation, it helps if you can approach some of these other pressure areas like finances like expectations at work and that and and uh if you say up front here's what i'm dealing with i found most people to be understanding and in giving you slack and helping you that's terrific that's that's I, i must say i love the humor in your books and that is the just i really find it 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 just makes it makes it fun to read but also it's really that situation of that you're dealing with this horrible situation something i would not wish on anybody to have to go through and you're being i i you walk walk the the reader through how you start to think about this and how you approach it can you talk a little bit about that it's a coping mechanism i think humor is is very powerful it releases endorphins and other things in the body that help the body function so um and we deal with humor humor is tragedy plus time i think Mark Twain said. So, if you can, uh, if you can look for the the humorous or at least the lighthearted in the midst of very dark times, and it's not always easy. But if you kind of try to do that along the way, it helps you see. Even if the window's not open very much, you can see maybe a little bit of sun sunlight on some days. Um, That's terrific. I, it was really even as, as simple as putting a port. You know, for for many physicians, so it's something just ordinary, but for a patient going through mm-hmm. it, putting a port or just sitting through, you know, six hours of chemo, you know, f- for physician or healthcare, just your shift work, and we do that in order. But seeing from your point of view, talking to the nurses, getting to know them, it's, 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 was, a, it's was a great... Uh, it sends a uh, message, I think, to yeah. the doctors and to the staff, to yeah. the nurses are great. Yeah. Uh, and when, you, when they see that how you're coping with stuff, I think it encourages them to lean into your care. I remember talking to Dr. Kerbikoff when I went through my first chemo, and, and I did some research on cisplatin, mm-hmm. which uh, the nurses call it mm-hmm. cisplatin. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember researching it, and I said, and I, I asked the doc, I said, you know, this has been around for like forever, yeah. since the 1950s. And I said, why don't they have anything more modern? And he said, because we haven't found anything more toxic. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gosh. you know, yeah. uh, and then uh, yeah. I remember after my first round of chemo, the nurses, I found a poster and I had it mounted and, and brought into the to the uh, chemo clinic. And it's a picture of a man in a hospital gown standing before St. Peter at the pearly gates. Mm -hmm. And St. Peter's looking at his clipboard, and the the man is saying, sorry, I'm late. I had great nurses. (laughs) So, you know, just if you feed back to the people that are caring for you, it helps them. Because they've got a hard job. When you have cancer, you're one person facing it. When somebody's job is to work with hundreds Mm -hmm. of people a year, many of whom won't make it, who have terminal diseases, that takes a special kind of person. And it's not just, I'm here to get something, it's mm-hmm. if I, I have to give back to these people who are giving to me because that's how they can stay in such a high, you know, a, a high pressure profession. 
Well, we appreciate that all, the, especially the nurses. I think they they work day in and day out. Yeah. And, and and again, and think of how traumatic it is. And then if that's your job, I think of first first responders. I have a son who's a fireman, policeman, mm-hmm. doctors. They're in very emotionally intense environments, sure. and it's. It's unrelenting. So you have to try to be, not just not be a burden, but try to be a blessing in that relationship. And I think for the doctors, and you might speak to this, you might want to give more time and energy to your patients, but how do you as a physician protect yourself, your family, and your private time uh, so that you don't become too emotionally wrapped up with all the patients you see? Yeah, it's often, I've heard it uh, described as going in to uh, save a a drowning person in the river, only to find out there's two more upstream, you go in and save them, and there's four more (laughs) upstream ahead of that, ahead of them. And so it it is a process, and uh, certainly provider burnout is a huge issue, and I think that's what we're, you know, seeing in this, uh, pre-COVID it was an issue, but now it's, I think, a huge, huge it's issue. an even bigger issue with what we're with seeing. With the doctors mm-hmm. being on the front line dealing with patients, but you're part of medical systems right. that require so much, it's a business, so much cash, can you push back on the system that's pushing from above and the pressure from below with the patients to find something you can... Today is very with? difficult. I... I came from a humble beginning. I'm originally from Iran, and 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 I've been through some of this. My brother had stomach cancer at age 45, and my wife had breast cancer. So I came to this country very, very you know, wrong, you know, probably wasn't the wrong time, and lost my financial and crawl up to to do many jobs in the restaurant and health business, EMT, do full body, just get myself up. I think um, you you learn to to make sure, number one, don't display what's happening at work to your family. Just keep them sort of separation mm-hmm. and make sure time for them because that's what you need. The end of the day, the end of the week, you need that that support, just like a patient needs the support of the family to be able to be. And secondly, I think um, for me, taking personal times off and, and, and little vacation time because when, for example, I, for many years, I take a month off, go back home, see my family, come back. By the third week, I'm so excited to come back to work. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I do not complain. I think it's just preventing knowing the fire you're going to run into. And, and every so often, it, it is. It piles up, you know, as telling Rob, you know, you have one day off, then you have to answer, you know, today's the computer and phone is your leash. You cannot get away, nowhere where in the world you are. So you have to answer this, you have to answer that, and, and then with commercialization of the medicine, the demand is to see that many patients, to see that many things, and answer this question. And of course, the insurance company says, hey, you are the doctor responsible, it's bad, we want you this productivity. Mm-hmm. Then the other person says, well, you have to make your time, you just not become a part of this ongoing um, assembly line. And, As a uh, physician, uh, can you control your patient flow, or is that out of your hands? To, minimally. To, today, yeah. minimally. Yeah. You yeah. can, but today's uh, the change. I just have my own, my own practice. I run it the way I wanted to do. I just put the time. I have spent, you know, 20 minutes with patient. I spent two hours with patient because it d- d- depends on your know, but shifting jobs now to, to the to other side. And I, I see a complete different. And what that's why I left uh, the bigger corporation. I think the bigger the corporation, the bigger... They do not see, they, they look at, I call them the invisible people, look at the screen, then they do not, everybody's just a patient for 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. For them, for you, that's a human contact. Yeah. This is the art that you have to balance. And I think I personally have changed my lifestyle to, or from what I was do to, to be at least carry what I'm doing and also with Rob that's why sort of you yeah. both slow down so we can tell the patient that you need to be take care of your own yeah. self in this in, there was that big you know the, the, the medicine is getting more complex the disease is getting more complex we can see younger people with cancer with all the you know industrial food and all of that so it's it's a it's an art that you don't want to leave your family and as, end up as many physicians suddenly find lonely at the 65, mm-hmm. 70, and everybody's gone. At the same time, you want to make sure that 
you do a great care for patients. So I think it's an individual base and and uh, and balancing between your hobbies and stuff like that to be a good physician. Do, do you have a, a message, Mike, for provider healthcare providers or for health systems, or is there anything you might change once you've you've been through this and you've seen so many uh, <clears throat> many many years? It's been like a, a decade through the health system, yeah. so you've seen <clears throat> it multiple times. Some some good experiences, some not so good experiences, some, some decisions where you had to say, okay, I'm going to change my provider, which is a mm-hmm. You know, pretty, pretty big deal. Have to get set up with a new doctor, a new referral, the whole thing. Could you describe that a little bit about how you went about that? I, I think it's not just the doctor; it's the it's the organization because the doctor is going to send you to a chemo clinic or a specialist mm-hmm. or somebody to do a biopsy, and you need an anesthesiologist in that. So, you look around for a team, and I think that's kind of created from the top down. You can tell from the person who checks you in to when you have to call with an insurance question, and um, I try to find. Try to find it. You know, there's always people and there's always bad days, but you try to find an organization that tries that you get a sense cares for you as an individual, not just a, a, a number. And uh, there are great nurses, there are great receptionists, just great people, lab techs, phlebotomists. You always want to have a good phlebotomist if you get poked as many times as I do. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, a beautiful bug, is that? Yeah. <laughs> it it's is. an important job. That's important, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 so, um, so it, and I've been very fortunate, like I say, and, and uh, I think that comes from the top down. It came, I think it came from Dax. It came from you, Rob, with the clinic there. So I, I think the doctors can set the tone that radiates through all the rest the system, of the situation. Exactly. And hopefully the doctor will go to a clinic in places like that where his clients are going and, and be as concerned about the care that they get there. And hopefully the CEOs understand that. Yeah. I remember one of the physicians being in town for many, many years, uh, unfortunately passed away. And uh, several years ago we had the conversation. He says, I used to see, charge my patient five bucks and come over there. I had one staff, was my everything. It was my nurse, my receptionist. Patient got great care. If he needed surgery, I would just call, see the surgeon made that afternoon the next day, and the problem solved. So today I have so many people by the end of his life <laughs> in my office that even I know how urgent for the patient to do, not bad enough to go to emergency room, but enough to yeah. save that. He says, I have to send a referral, then it could be denied, then send to that. He's not on the panel, send him to another. That problem can take about two or three weeks for a remedy, which takes another two or three weeks. So, so the complexity of this has made the, yeah. the humanity part of it up. But hopefully, you know, we have some solution. As I said, we still have step in and well, prevent that. I think the balance is don't expect the doctor to become your best friend. Mm-hmm. They don't have the time for it, but get a sense of whether they see you, they hear you, they're interacting with you as a person, mm-hmm. and that that radiates through the rest of the organization. I 100% agree. And I, I must say, I'm, I'm curious about this uh, this third book. Could you give us some um, some some thoughts about or wh- where you're at with that, and also just kind of some just some background on that and why you decided to to, to do that. Well, I I coined it. That's probably not a new term, but uh, we I was curious about near death experiences, and I've read about them and researched them, and they are life altering. People who have had NDEs, uh, they have been put in. Uh, MRIs and brain scans and that there are physical changes that happen to somebody who looks over the edge of the valley of shadow of death and then gets to stay up on top for a while. And I would call my cancer experience a near, next to near death experience. So it's not you're going to die right today and you come back, but it's you're close enough for a while that it changes you, changes how you look at life. Uh, For me, it changed my diet. Uh, it changed. I started doing meditation and focusing on mindfulness because of the health benefits of that. It made people more important and possessions less important. Um, so there, when you have something that's life-threatening, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, all the way to the end for it to impact you. And I would say, let it. Death is not a surprise. It's going to get all of us. I tell people. You know, the Grim Reaper has missed me a few times, but he never runs out of ammo. Mm-hmm. So one of these bullets is going to land. So uh, between now and then, though, you know, live with that awareness. People are important. Experiences are important. Uh, bank accounts are okay to get by, but, you know, you don't, you're not going to come back 
to look at your funeral and see how many people are talking about how much you left behind. It's the it's the experiences. Uh, so a, a, a near death or a next to near death experience can change life. And so the the idea of a third book is just to continue the story. Um, I had five occurrences of cancer between 55 and 65 years old, and I've been clean since my last uh, bone marrow transplant for five years. But I don't take, you know, I, I don't take that for granted. Can you go through whether well, you had non-Hodgkin lymphoma or then squamous? Can you tell us all? Well, what's I had the uh, lymphoma came back four times. Four I had, times. Yeah, and the squamous cell. Uh, I had once, so okay. the uh, the odds of you know surviving a second bone marrow transplant, as I remember, were between nine and twenty three percent. So not my favorite choice, but the, well, you're the, alive. The, yeah, the odds of dying if you don't do it are about a hundred percent. So, yeah. <laughs> so you play the odds. So my, the the title of the current book I'm working on is called uh, uh, "What Happens When You Don't Die," and the subtitle is "Living on House Money." Because the, the gambling metaphor, of course, is you go in and if you make something that's not yours, it's house money. So any extra days you get after a terminal diagnosis or living on house money, so how does that affect how you live? So that's kind of the, the focus of this current book. One thing I read, I mean, I'm still reading your book, in, in our today's modern medicine quote, in the United States it's tough to bridge that with meditation, alternative medicine, well-being, diet is just a sort of disease, you know, curative disease for one thing than that. And I'm trying to, Rob and I, we're trying to just mix that, you know, it's, you are what you eat to do that. How what was your experience through the medical field I, and, 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 and what, what your thought is to I bridge it? I applaud what together. you're doing because the, the Western medicine has been more focused on fixing what's broken and Eastern medicine has more been focused on health, right. not disease. Doctors don't make anything if you're healthy here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it, but we're holistic creatures. What we eat, how we think, how we sleep, how we handle stress affects uh, you know our body. So we have to have a more holistic approach to it. Um, and so th- I, I didn't pay attention to it until I had cancer, and then I've paid attention since. Uh, I'm not as strict as I could be, because I think there's a balance between uh, enjoying your, you know, living to live and, you know, eating to live and living to eat. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so I, I applaud what you're doing to take a holistic view, everything from what you eat to how you handle your finances, to your friendships, to, you know, um, Keeping up with the latest of, that we're finding out in terms of medical technology and that. Um, I think a glass of uh, wine with dinner is a good thing. I think coffee is not a drug, it's a vitamin. You know, you make some adjustments as you go through life. <laughs> you, you find what's a healthy balance that you can live with and that in, enhances life and doesn't burden it. To your experience, have you came to a doctor that says, you know, this is the way it is and don't do other have What was your have you come? I'm sure you've seen so many doctors here in Denver. How are your, I want to see with the doctor's point of view when you have you asked him, so, you know, I want to do alternative, you know, mix. I have, and Rob, Rob has been my oncologist for many years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't blame my relapse on Rob. He did the best he could. It's mm-hmm. just, uh, I, the, cancer is a civil war. Yeah, That's right. yeah. And uh, <laughs> cancer. <laughs> Cancer is your own body attacking yourself. So, uh, so, but I've always been able with Rob to talk about the alternatives. We've talked about meditation. We've talked about diet, and the, the interesting thing is to watch that these are things he's doing in his own life. Uh, so it's not just uh, handing out prescriptions. It's a lifestyle that he believes in and that he tries to communicate to his patients. Which is one reason I think we're doing this today. Is and I can say from the patient perspective, that's very healthy, not just to have somebody hand you a, a list of things to do, but to, to see that he's modeling that in mm-hmm. terms of his own life. So, Yeah, hopefully, the, I think, you know, going to some of the, all these meetings, you know, nationally, I think the, it's particularly in GI, the diet is, which is for me so important, is this one of those like 10, 20 minutes lectures and going through the, you know, the new t- approach techniques and all the things. So I think, you know, I train <laughs> briefly in, in China as well. You see the people, you know, eating is, is a medicine. Exactly. Every day is a food, is, is a nutrient, water, provide the things. So in here, you know, it's, 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 I'm, I'm hoping that be a whole new looks into the 
um, Western medicine to to approach it from you know ground zero to, to up not only procedural things that w- what we can we have advanced quite a bit, but also just how to preventative medicine. Yeah, it's more holistic. I think taking a, a, a holistic approach. I think cancer is like a weed, uh, and the body is like a garden. You can do things to make weeds less likely to take over, and if you don't, then they're th- you know they're more likely to impact you so but again find a balance something that you can sustain not something that's unsustainable and that kind of depends on your own circumstances and temperament Uh, better to do something you can sustain than to have a a crash diet or a crash exercise program that's gone in a month you're uh could you describe mike your outlook on life since all this so clearly it's there's been you know this has been a huge change in your uh, these can the cancers and also other other events in your life loss of your loss of your wife um, after the it was I think after the first um, after the first round of treatment was yeah that, was life that right? uh, life can can uh, gang tackle you it's not like well I've had cancer so I should I should be uh, off the the schedule for a while it's not like jury duty once you show up you don't get off for a couple of years at one point I thought about. Uh, filing a change of address and then not moving and seeing if that would throw whatever was after me <laughs> off the trail. Uh, it didn't work. But uh, it shortly, just as I was coming off my uh, treatment for, uh, after my first bone marrow transplant, there's two years of rituxan uh, chemo. Just as I was coming off of that two years, uh, my wife of 37 years uh, had a sudden heart attack on Thanksgiving. Uh, in 2011 mm-hmm. and and died so we went through this whole process of preparing for my death funeral plans plot everything like that and then I'm the one that's still here and she was she was gone so there are no that hence the title of the second book we will be landing shortly now what and that comes from my time on planes in the late 20th century and flight attendants would inevitably say we will be landing shortly and as a grammarian, I would always think in my head, I do not want to land shortly. <laughs> Can we please land soon? <laughs> and they still say it. So the idea is whether you have time to put your tray table up or whether you crash land, we're all going to land. So mm-hmm. now what? How do you live in light of the fact that you could go for years with a, in fighting a terminal disease or you could you know, go to your son's house for Thanksgiving and, and never come home. So it's the reality that you don't want to make you macabre, but it's the reality that makes you, you know, live on house, house money. And I, I mean, you told us about it, but if, if like you, you take a slice of a day that we are 54 and a slice of your day today, how different are you? Um... <clears throat> More well, the meditation is new. I make time each day to walk and to meditate. Mindfulness is a mindset that I wouldn't have bought in. I might have bought into it through other circumstances. I bought into it through the through the cancer, mm. thinking about okay, if I'm only here for a short period of time, uh, what's the current like for a second bone marrow transplant? Do you know what the uh, like say nine to twenty three percent of surviving it the first year and survivability is five years still. So when you think you might have a fairly short diagnosis, then you adjust your life. The, the trick is when you find out you're going to live longer, you, you shouldn't lose that mindset because life is still short. Mm. So pay attention to what's going on in your head. Pay attention to the people around you. Uh, spend more time on experiences than on you know, saving up or buying things that you don't necessarily need. It's, it's a whole, I would say holistic is probably the word that I've done that would describe a, a better quality of life than I had before when I was more focused on just a couple of areas. How about your interaction with other humans? Well, I wrote, I wrote the book to tell people I've gone through this and I've tried to be fairly candid about it mm-hmm. uh, because I think one of the things we can share with others is our experiences. Right. So I, I, I can tell people I know what you're going through. I've been there. Uh, so uh, And a lot of times that's what we want to hear. We want somebody to know that uh, you know, they've been through the same thing, and they know what you're going through. Yeah, I see. It too. I mean, uh, I've been sort of like when I like to travel through the country and been, you know, been New York or, or, or Louisiana, different things. Sometimes the bigger the city, sometimes you feel the more lonelier the people. Mm-hmm. 
and have that, those people with cancel and ask him, says, who can I call? And suddenly the fan says, I'm here all alone. And, and that's, you know, they have spent building or being themselves and making nicer car, bigger homes. And then suddenly finding that uh, there's nobody around. And I think that's, uh, that's, yeah. uh, that's, that's, that's. Loneliness that's a, is that's toxic. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's not healthy. Yeah, so. And our society has bought into the externals, like mm -hmm. you say, bank account. Mm -hmm. um, I remember reading one time, I, I don't wear a watch because I have a phone now, but I remember reading one time about a gentleman who, who had a, well, I don't know what watches are now, but mm -hmm. it was a ten, twenty thousand mm dollars -hmm. Rolex type watch. And he was in an elevator one day, and somebody asked him why he spent so much money on his watch. And he said, because I can't drive my Mercedes in the elevator. <laughs> so it's basically, it's, this is a status symbol. This is so you know. Uh, so what the hood ornament or my address, my zip code, those are ways to tell other people. But bottom line is you. How do you live with yourself? And what do you want to see out of your life? And it comes down, I think, m most often to experiences and relationships. So That's terrific. That's you got to have money to have those things, and I'm not disper discouraging yeah. that. Yeah. But the, those things aren't going to give back to you the way that a relationship or an experience can. Yeah, many times I talk to my patients, I say the most important investment of your life is your health. Yeah. If you're not healthy, you know, how beautiful homes you have, yeah. and just yeah. the world is. And as you, once you live, you yeah. know, that's it. <laughs> you cannot. I, I have a, my working definition of health is your range of opportunities. Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm healthy, what are my range of opportunities? Mm -hmm. I played pickleball yesterday. Mm -hmm. I did qigong with my wife this afternoon. I can jog. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do everything I used to do, but, it, it, you know, wealth gives you a range of opportunities. So financial wealth means you have opportunities. Physical health means you have opportunities. So if you maintain as much as you can, about your physical health, then you've got more opportunities, more options. You are going to China or, or Egypt, you look at those, they have tried so much to be prepared for their afterlife, but <laughs> it was just, <laughs> it's, it's nothing, it says, you know, this is, you cannot keep it, um, what that was, I think, I forgot whose actor was, was he says, you know, and you're gone, no matter how big is your U-Haul you behind yeah. your hearse is. Oh. Right. Is, is worthless. Yeah. <laughs> You're going. Yeah. So you cannot just take it with you. Yeah. Yeah, so, as, yeah. as physicians, can you talk to people about the spiritual or the relational side of life, or is that off limits? We, we can. We can. We can. There's, the problem is the time. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just the, uh, you know, we have these visits that we have. Our office is very, um, we feel very privileged. We have 30 minutes with patients, but mm -hmm. many, many providers have only 15, maybe 20. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I need that extra time. I like that having that extra time is that it gives us that, that little, little extra latitude to yeah. have those conversations about lifestyle. And you mentioned this, this holism approach to life, which I mm -hmm. love, that, that it's, it's not just the diet, exercise, sleep, and stress management, but it's also the relationships and how you structure your life and the range of opportunities. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to get into all that in a visit, yeah. but we can. We <laughs> I, I, try. You know, I, I do a lot of preventive measures, try to scope and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I try to, you know, nurses sometimes pressure me. You know, says, "This is my little moment. I can change somebody's diet." I mean, uh, you know, Rob and I had talked about like you know, you end up stuff with reflux, you end up with esophageal cancer. You know, you eat bad diet, you end up with with colon cancer. You drink too much, you end up with mm -hmm. cancer. And I try to. You know, to write little things. This is why you take it so much to. I says, you know, maybe they, they maybe if one out of ten listen to me, maybe they can change preventing. Yeah, a little I, bit. I, yeah, little little bit, bit yeah, I just um, I have tried very hard, or I'm trying, but as as the numbers comes out, this is is that's uh, that's the, the thing of the medicine that is. I'm hoping that we have some reversal, but I don't see it the way the the from you know. Farm, it was a pharmacology and the way the industry is, food industry and the way the, you know, all this insurance company is, it's just, I think, attacking from uh, yeah. different things. But we are hoping that, you know, we reach some patients, we reach some of our colleagues, tell them that is, is, is a, the patient is not the thing that you get rich as a patient, that you have to take care of them and then your reward will come later mm -hmm. on. It's not a commodity that... Yeah. That is so 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 so. There's some. I'm 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 uh, optimistically hopeful 
that be some changes in, uh, I think, Western medicine. I have what I call a life sentence. And uh, in my 20s, I tried to define, you know, what is it that I'm put on earth to do? And uh, after post-cancer and that, I, I revised what I call my life sentence. And I shortened it. And it's basically that I choose to enrich others through personal relationships and the written word. So my optimal verb is enrich. Uh, so if I have a contact with the person, whether it's through my writing or through a conversation like this or somebody you meet in the grocery store, my goal is, is can I enrich that person and, and can I be open to be enriched by others? It's that reciprocal relationship, I think, that is uh, that makes life resonate What's the for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I definitely have to work on my life. I think I have to work on some homework to do tonight. <laughs> so. yeah, life yeah, and then uh, I have a summary of the history of medicine, which is in my book, which I don't know if you want to close with that or not. Sure, please. Because I don't know what we'll say after this. <laughs> a short history of medicine. I wish I knew who first wrote this down, but I think it's pretty accurate. In 2000 B.C., medicine, it's the, these, this is a dialogue. 2000 B.C., here, eat this root. 1000 B.C., that root is heathen. Say this prayer. 1850 A.D. That prayer is superstitious. Drink this potion. 1940. That potion is snake oil. Swallow this pill. 1985. That pill is ineffective. Take this antibiotic. 2000. That antibiotic is artificial. Here, eat this root. <laughs> <laughs> so... The, most of what we need is, is n native to the planet. Most of our drugs are, come from some native plant Plants. or herb. So the closer we can get to nature, I think, the healthier we are because we're living in, in symbiotic relationship with our environment. So What you highly recommend to, to make put in history, there's a great physician. His name is Avicina. Yes. He, he wrote Canal of Medicine over a thousand years ago. He wrote yeah. seven volume of it. He's the first book that he made out of all the, you know, quote, tribal medicine to a seven volume books, which I read very frequently. Yeah. Unfortunately, only one of them translated in English. It was the, 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 the book, textbook <laughs> until 300 years ago um, to all the world, I mean, all the Chinese, Indian, or Persian <laughs> medicine comes from yeah. that. And... Um, but I think uh, still uh, the humanity was is the key things of the yeah. part of the healing and, and several other physicians, Razi as well. I, I read that their stories and how well, and good medicine better. is a balance. Balance is, is it is nothing. The, the bad thing is with yeah. technology has have, has we have come a long way, but I think in the way when I read his book other things, we have lose the human touch and the human yeah. perspective, and, and I hope that we can get. Back to a balance yeah. of that between the ancient and present, whether the Greek medicine said, so, I mean, you have the technology has, since even in the past mm -hmm. 20, 30 years, you know, everything, in, at least in GI, has changed. And I, and I really appreciate make the diagnosis earlier, stuff like that. But hopefully, we can get to that human touch and have a good yeah. balance. Well, Mike, that was just beautiful. Thank you so much for doing this, my friend, and uh, really uh, hope to talk to you again. And we'd love to hear about the third book and the progress. <laughs> and we'll get all this in the we'll get the books in the show notes. We have Stumbling Toward Heaven, and we'll be landing shortly. As uh, available on Amazon. Awesome. If you're interested, and my email is on there. So if anybody is going through a cancer journey, and you know wants to talk or dialogue, I'm open. So. Thank you so much. And Mike has also written a variety of other other books as well. So you have a whole whole bunch of other other books you've uh, written for various organizations and different purposes. So thank you again. And uh, thank you. And I'm glad that you heard play pickleball. Maybe one of yes. these days we play together. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate thank you. it. It's an honor thank to you. have you here. Thanks again for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us at rob at doctordoc.health or abbas at doctordoc.health. If you have a moment and can leave us a review, that would be great as it helps others find our podcast in the search algorithms. And we'll see you on the next episode of Dr. Doc.